estar hablando sobre un tema muy interesante que es IPv6, seguridad en Internet y el Internet de las cosas inseguras, ¿no? Un título que en lo personal me encantó. El, bueno, es una mezcla de varios temas que, que va a estar tratando. Creo que tenemos algo muy, muy interesante ahorita entre manos. Eh, para presentar brevemente a, a Bob, quien tiene un currículum muy, muy extenso, pero de manera breve podemos mencionar que, que él es, check, es un fellow de, de Checkpoint, ha trabajado anteriormente en otras empresas como Nokia, es participante de, en la IETF desde el año 1985, es autor de más de 40 RFCs y drafts dentro de la IETF, ha sido chair o presidente, para intentarlo traducir al español, del IAOC, del, del ITF Administrative Oversight, del año 2009 al 2013, también ha estado en el IAB, que es el Internet Architecture Board, y yeah, entre muchísimas not. otras cosas. Y probablemente lo que más relevante que puedo mencionar aquí, entre tantas cosas, es que el señor Bob es el autor principal del RFC 2460, que es el que conocemos como el, quizás el corazón de lo que de IPv6 como tal. Bueno, hoy en día el 8200. Pero bueno, eh, vamos a esperar que conecte. Are you ready, Bob? Hi. Uh, Not completely. Okay. Here we go. Well, thank you so much for being here, Bob. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, this is the well. Officially, it's my second time in Panama, but the first time was just changed just on an airplane that didn't only landed and took off again to refuel. Um, and I also had a um, I sort of took a, a little time off from the meeting yesterday and went to visit the Panama Canal yesterday morning, and that was very nice. And um, you know, it was very sort of also for my talk. It's it was very interesting to see. You know, there was the, the original locks and systems that were built, you know, over 100 years ago. But then, more recently, finished in 2016, there were uh, a set of larger locks built to accommodate larger ships. And I couldn't help but think of the analogy between IPv4 and IPv6. So, you know, we, we had to build a bigger internet. So, um, just like you needed to build a bigger Panama Canal. So, um, what I'm going to talk today is about IPv6, particularly how we got to where we are today and what I think are the, what's the current status and where we're going, uh, and then talk about internet security, which is always an interesting topic, and then, but, and then lastly, um, what I call the internet of insecure things. Um, so I've been very fortunate in my career to have started this when it was still a research project um, with ARPA in the U.S., so sort of in the late, I got involved in the ARPANET in the late 70s and then sort of moved to what became the Internet, um, you know, in the 80s. And, you know, I didn't, I won't claim to have invented the Internet, but I got to work with the people who did. And, and it's been really quite an amazing experience, very gratifying to sort of been involved in a technology that's had such a big impact on the world. And mostly positive, but there are clearly a lot of things going on today that are not so positive, and, but I think we will get, get through that. So I'll first start with IPv6. Um, so in the early 90s, when this all started, um, you know, and this is something I think most people today have forgotten, uh, it wasn't clear that, you know, what we call the internet protocols, TCP, IP, were going to be successful. Um, it, it clearly was not the commercial, desired commercial solution. There were lots of competitors. There was the OSI connectionless protocol, uh, which had government backing, had big company backing, um, you know, there was ATM was coming along, AT&T said they were going to build a business internet based on the I, IPX protocols. So this was the fact that this ended up being the internet was not at all clear. It was just the opposite. It was, 
in some ways perhaps even successful because it wasn't the official anointed thing. We just got to build it and it happened to work and um, they, we didn't make the mistake of charging extra for it. So, but it, it was not at all clear then that it was gonna be successful. Um, you know, there were predictions of internet meltdowns. Bob Metcalf, who invented Ethernet, sort of had this very public thing about if the internet didn't melt down, he'd eat his hat, and he was wrong, and sort of did eat his hat. Um, the IT, what we, you know, the IETF, the group that does internet protocol standards, was not even con considered an official standards organization. So, you know, it, it and, and then in detail, not having a plan for what followed IPv4 was a real issue. So, you know, IPv6 sort of came out of this environment, but it, it, it wasn't a short, you know, the whole internet, TCP IP internet that we use today was not a sure thing. And, and the people with the money didn't think it was a, you know, we're betting on other things. So it's, it's really um, come a long way. Um, so I found some old slides from around 1995 when I worked at a startup called Ypsilon Networks. You know, and in some ways things haven't changed very much. You know, we were, were predicting internet growth. This is sort of a generic graph. You don't need any dates on it. It's always true. And it's pretty much what's, what's happened and what continues to happen. Um, and then, you know, in 1995, this is what I thought was causing the growth. And I, you know, look back on it and believing it was, you know, it's, it was actually very, very correct vision. You know, we, we were gonna have more of the devices we had today, or, you know, in 1995, we were gonna add real commerce and advertising. I mean, that's clearly happened. You know, we buy lots of things online. Lots of services are paid by advertising, but this was not not something that was accepted then. We're going to have new users, you know, new, large countries, new industries, um, and then we're going to network everything. It's not not just big computers. That was sort of the case at the time, and so this this you know we were thinking about these issues back in 1995. So it's not you know we, the problem has always been there. It's, this is, these are not things that were discovered later. So the timeline for the development of IPv6, we called it IP Next Generation then. Um, so it started at, you know, around the early 90s, uh, internet was growing exponentially, and it started to look like we were running out of addresses, particularly the class B addresses. The internet was sort of structured in three classes, A, B, and C. You know, they had, A's had um, short, um, short prefixes and lots of host addresses. C's were the opposite. They had a long prefix and a few host addresses. B's were sort of were divided in between 16 bits each way. And those were the most desirable because you could have, you know, 256 hosts with class C wasn't enough. And so the B, it looked like we were running out of class B addresses. Um, so the ITF formed a group called ROAD, R Routing and Addressing. Um, and the result of that was recommending um, CIDR and, and to develop a next generation IP protocol. Um, and, and CIDR, you know, both of these I think turned out to be very important. Now, the thing that happened shortly after that was um, the Internet Architecture Board decided to, you know, issue its IP version 7, um, or, or I guess I would say this, they decided to tell the internet community what the next protocol was going to be, as opposed to asking or say, we think you should do this, what do you think? Um, this came to be known as the Kobe incident because the meeting where they did this was in Kobe, Japan. Well, this sort of created a revolution in the IETF. Um, it took Vint Cerf to come and uh, sort of settle things down. But, it, you know, the IAB just asserted too much authority, and the result was the community took the authority away. So it's, you know, it's, uh, 
and in some ways the IAB never recovered from that. Um, and maybe th they need to be reminded of it from time to time. Um, so the result was the sort of the current model in the ITF where we have the IESG, Internet Engineering Steering Group, which, net, which then now makes, makes the standards decision. Before that, they, there still was an ISG, but they, they sort of did something and then passed it on to the IAB, and the IAB made a standards decision. So that all got changed. The IAB was sort of go work on architecture and um, don't, you know, stay away from standards. Um, so the, so, you know, later in the year, the ITF issued a formal call for proposals for a new IP protocol. Um, the ISG took responsibility for this. Uh, they formed an area. The ITF likes to form areas like routing, um, you know, like transport, et cetera. Um, and so uh, a new area was formed, and they published an RFC, which was a you know IPNG solicitation. It had the requirements of what was needed, um, and then there were a number of proposals done. I'll talk more about this. Um, and then in 1994, there was a, a, a recommendation. So we've been doing this for a long time. Um, so this is sort of the model, sort of graphical view of the different proposals. Um, and you can see the, the one in the middle here, um, there was a number of proposals that absorbed others and sort of built, built a larger base of support. And that's what became IPv6. Um, I was in, you know, in some ways it was a combination of the work of Steve Deering for the created what he called SIP, Simple IP, um, and then combining the work of some work that I did, the work that Paul Francis did to create SIP with two Ps, Simple IP Plus, and then I, that, became the, that became the basis for IPv6 with some changes, which I'll talk about. And um, you might wonder why it's um, IP version 6 as opposed to IP version 5. Well, there, there was a protocol called Streams Protocol, or ST, um, that had been allocated years before but it was not a complete. It, w it was not a complete internet protocol. It ran next to um, IPv4, so you couldn't. It wasn't really a candidate. It was for real time. It's one. For a lot of research into in real time, video and audio was done. But you can see with, they also assigned um, IP version numbers to um, the other candidates, um, and so what. Be came IPv6 was assigned six, and the others were seven, eight, and nine. Um, and then I, I will note that um, someone actually wrote a, a short proposal for a protocol called IP version 16, thinking that would be better to have a bigger number. But it's sort of hard when you have a four-bit ver version field to, to identify protocol 16. That doesn't really work. So that didn't go very far. So I'll go through the different proposals. But first, um, CIDR is classless interdomain routing. We do this today. It's, it's a big part about how the internet works now. Um, you know, we re relax the fixed boundaries in the IP address allocation. Before then, it was just flat. You had a network number, and that was, that was routed. There was no aggregation, and that was fine when the, you know, we had hundreds or maybe even a thousand networks, but it clearly didn't scale. But by also doing this, we got much better utilization of the address space. The, we didn't have these fixed size blocks for, of different length prefixes. Um, and these, these blocks are, were, as part of CIDR, were allocated to providers. It sort of became the basis for, I think, the way the registry system works today. Um, so CIDR, CIDR was, turned out, was very important, and it, it greatly increased address utilization and, you know, made the route, routing scale a lot better. 
So Tuba was TCP over bigger addresses. It, it was really the running TCP UDP over the ISO connectionless protocol. So it was sort of another version of what the IAB had tried to do. Um, and, and its, its strength was it used CLNP, uh, which was the ISO connectionless network protocol, but it was also its weakness because there, there were arguments about um, change control, did ISO control it, did the ITF control it, could we change it, a whole bunch of things. So, it, you know, in hindsight, you know, there was a deployed base of CLMP, but by, by today's standards, it was very small. Um, I, I actually think the people behind this made a mistake by not saying it could be um, changed. They didn't, they didn't want to break their, their current installed base. I, th I think that was strategically a big mistake. They should have allowed changes given the ITF change control. We may, be, we may have had a different outcome if they had done that. Um, catnip was um, done by some different people. It, it was really sort of building, uh, trying to leverage the mixture of the OSI and the no Novell IPX protocols um, to increase scale and performance. The IPX protocols were very successful. It was originally developed by Xerox, uh, and they, were, they worked quite well, but they, didn't, they were not thinking about a global solution, so they didn't, didn't do that very well. But it worked really well inside of a company. It had auto address, you know, you created addresses automatically. Um, basically, you just plugged it together and it worked. It had a bunch of good features. Uh, SIP was sort of this hybrid of the simple IP protocol invented by Steve Deering, um, and um, so th these were all became working groups. I was one of the chairs of this, along with Steve and Paul Francis. Uh, you know, th it's documented, um, and it was sort of a, based on a merger of the NCAPS proposal with SIP and, and PIP, and so we called it SIP with two Ps. Um, so it was a clean design from SIP, um, but it was deemed that the addresses were too small um, and the extended addressing model was too complicated. So, it, you know, it, it's sort of interesting that, you know, when the ITF sort of took formal charge here, of course, you had the committee effect of, you know, of reaching compromises. So the Probably the biggest debate at the end was how big, what kind of addresses there should be and how big they should be. Uh, and it was down between the fixed size 64-bit addresses of SIP. I mean, this was nice. It, it, it increased the address space quite a lot. Uh, it met all the requirements by three orders of magnitude. Um, but the nice thing about SIP is it kept the packet header the same size as IPv4. You took out fields like the fragmentation ID and, and options, so, so I ended up with still had a 20 byte header. I think this was really a very nice design. Uh, and, and if I was in charge, I would have picked that, but I wasn't. Um, the other approach was the CLNP addresses, um, you know, variable length addresses up to 160 bits. Uh, so this was nice, it was compatible with the OSI NSAP plan, it was large enough for auto configuration, um, and in theory you could start with short addresses and grow later. The problem with this was that the actual practice with CLNP was not, they didn't use the variable length addresses in, in a variable way. They were all fixed, I think 160 byte addresses, which are sort of, in hindsight, sort of large and not a number that maps well into, you know, computers then and computers today. Things tend to be on 32, 64-bit boundaries. So it was sort of an awkward design. Um, and so you, no one could point to any real practice where variable length addresses were actually used. They just picked a big number and did that. Uh, so the compromise out of the ITF process was to basically use the SIP protocol, but double the addresses from 64 to 128. And, um, you know, I, 
still not sure that was the right thing, but I, I was a firm believer in fixed length addresses because I think it's just a lot simpler. Um, and I don't think, you know, so we ended up with 128 bit addresses and um, it, this allowed us to do things like the auto configuration that, that IPX did and, and CLNP did where you could just learn a prefix and create a token and put them together and cr automatically create an address. So, so I think that was sort of a good justification for it. But, you know, it, it did make the, the headers bigger um, and, you know, it made the addresses bigger. So the result of this was um, IPNG was based on SIP with 128-bit addresses. Uh, a working group was created. I was the document editor at the time. Steve Deering and Ross Callen were the chairs. Um, and the goal was to sort of rem re close remaining issues, complete the unfinished work, and move it to proposed standard. And this was done. And it was first published as RFC 1883 in December of 1995. So um, what is that? Um, a little over 20, is that 20 or 30 years now? So we've been doing this a long time. So the, the good news was we did run out of addresses, IPv4 addresses. We were right about that. Our timing was a little off, I would say. I mean, 1995 is sort of on the left-hand side of this. But in, in January 2011, IANA gave out its last big block of addresses. Obviously, if you've heard all the presentations here. There still are addresses left, but there's fewer and fewer large block of addresses, and it's turned into a market a market of addresses. So, you know, for big service providers, you, the, it, the writing was clearly on the wall that you just weren't going to get extremely large block of addresses anymore. Um, and then you've hopefully seen this, but I mean, I like to look at the Google stats because, um, but you know, Google is now seeing over a little over 22 percent of the, their access is with IPv6. And so I don't know how many packets, packets this is, but I'm pretty sure it's a really big number. So a large, very, I mean, so IPv6 has become, I think, very successful, you know, on the internet ba based on Google and Facebook and, you know, Netflix and a lot, a lot of large content providers. So the, and, and the work of lots of ISPs. Um, so, you know, IPv6, I think has become very successful, but we, ha we still have a long way to go, to go from, you know, in this case, Google's case, you know, 22, 23% um, to, um, to actually replacing V4. I think that's gonna be a long time. Um, so one thing you may have noticed, and Lee actually talked about this a little bit, you notice that it looks like it's leveled off a little bit the first part of this year. But if you actually look closer, it does this every year. You can see the, um, at the beginning of each calendar year, things are sort of leveled off. And I think it's the way operators um, tend to deploy new things. There's sort of a slow, they don't make big changes towards the end of the year. And then, and then it takes a while to get going again. But I, so I think we're starting to see this continue to go up. Um, North America ISP status, lots of large ISPs are fairly far along in their V6 deployment. Um, I think this is quite good. You know, it's a mixture of access providers and, and wireless providers. I think the, the wireless community cell phones have, have adopted V6 very well. Um, you know, and s several of them have built essentially IPv6 only networks and they do translation at the edge. And I think this works very well. I think that's in fact the mo I mean, right now we're in dual, use dual stack most places, but I think this is the next step in the transition where more people, more networks will have v6 and only do tram v4 translation at the edge. Um, and then I sort of also from the, from Google, I sort of, this, this is the country stats in Latin America or in the Latinx region. Um, it was interesting. I first put these, you know, updated these slides last week and I went 
this morning and just looked at the numbers again, and several of the countries here have actually gone up significantly in the last week. And I don't know why that is, but I think it's a very good thing. So, you know, I think we're seeing lots of growth in this region. I think you've heard about it in many of the other talks. Um, but it, it, certainly, it certainly seems to be happening here. There are clearly some countries who are behind the others, but, you know, you know like in Brazil, um, with 25%, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very big percentage already. So I think that's very good. And I think V6 is particularly attractive in places where V4 addresses have been scarce. So another bit of recent news is IPv6 is now what the IETF calls an internet standard. Before that, it was a draft standard. Um, but last July, we published a new version of the spec, RFC 8200, that is now has the status of internet standard. And this is in some ways a very big deal because it's the IETF telling the world that IPv6 is stable, it's, there's not going to be lots of, you know, there's not gonna be major changes going forward. You know, you can go implement it safely and know that it's very mature. And, and I think this matches the deployment experience we're seeing today. So the state of IPv6 today, I mean, first, the good news. Um, I think all major platforms support it. You know, the major operating systems, Mac OS, Windows 10, Linux, Android, iOS, most, most router and switch vendors and firewalls do it. Um, major content providers support IPv6 now. That's what, you know, lots of ISPs support it. That's what's generating these traffic numbers. You know, if you just had, you can't just have the vendors, you can't just have the content providers, you can't just have the ISPs, you need them all. And that's what we're starting to, I think that's what, where we are today. Um, CDNs have provided a nice way for some hosting companies to get V6 access, because they're already essentially fronting for the site, and so they can provide access with V4 or V6, and I think that's how a lot of sites are doing it. Um, AWS, Amazon Web Services, um, now supports IBV6. And we're just starting to see some enterprises working on going to IPv6 only. So I think that's um, all very good. You know, I'm, I, I can't say that it's, um, if I, I think I'd say if, if I'd known how hard this, or all of us working on this, if we had known how hard and long it was gonna be, it's, we probably would have run away. But, you know, we were always optimistic that, you know, it would be better next year. So I think it has gotten a lot better. But we still have a number of challenges going forward. Um, you know, we have what I'll call mid-sized sites. We have bank and commerce sites that don't do it today. Um, enterprises are mostly IPv4, smaller ISPs many IoT devices, the devices that I would have thought would have immediately gone to IPv6, though there are some exceptions to that. Um, and we still, I still see new network products come with IPv6 only. You know, I s saw this in a lot of the mesh wireless products. They don't support IPv6. You know, I, I, I have this sort of hobby where I see something new, so I go to the support site and ask them, do you support IPv6 yet? And, a lot of them say, oh no, or it's not needed, or so we have a little argument and I tell them I won't buy it until they support IPv6. Um, I had a great success with a, a wireless company, a wireless mesh company called Aero, and they happened to be in, you know, in San Francisco near me, and so I offered, so I managed to get in touch with someone technical there, and I went up and gave a talk, and, you know, I don't know, six months to nine months later, they fairly recently announced IPv6 support, and of course they sent me some gear, and that's what I'm using today in my house. So that, that process works. So I, I recommend that to everyone. You know, if you know people in vendors who don't do it, go talk to them, go offer to help them, not just yell at them, but 
go offer to help them and tell them help them with how to do it and it, 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 at least in this case it worked and I'm very happy you know I'll give a product pitch I'm very happy with their solution it made my wireless at home is much better it's faster and it, of course it supports IPv6 so so we have come a really long way but we have a lot more to do um, you know it's we need to get the 80 90 percent I think um, and then then we're after that, I don't think we'll have to measure it anymore. We won't care, because just most things will run over IPv6. So I have an, a number of conclusions from this, um, you know, this work. Um, so we were right that we were running out of IPv4 addresses. Um, but we, I mean, this was sort of, we made the decisions here just before and that really started to happen. And I don't think we understood what the impact of network address translation was going to be. And that, that's, I think, I think the thing that really pushed out the deployment because it no longer became a pressing problem because you just use private addresses in your organization and you didn't need to have as many public ad global addresses as before. So we were clearly not right about how long it would take to develop IP6. It took took longer in the ITF than I think we were thinking. I think when we did the first RFC, we probably thought we were done. Uh, we were not right about when IPv4 addresses would run out. Uh, they lasted a lot longer. I mean, the way they were being allocated when we did this is very different from what happened afterwards. Um, and basically, we had no idea how hard and long it was to deploy this. Um, but we did make IPv6 happen by building a broad community of motivated and dedicated people. And this is, you know, I think Steve Deering and I were, the, we came, we realized very early that, you know, we couldn't, if we wanted this to happen, we needed to get lots of other people to work on it. So we needed to get them to have ownership as well. It was, you know, we have our names on these protocol specs, but, you know, you can't get stuff done if you just, to try to hold on to everything. We really needed to build a much larger community. And, you know, so I'm always very gratified to come to events like he here and hear people I've never met before talking about doing IPv6. I think it's really cool. And so I thank you very much. But you're all doing the right thing for the internet. Um, we clearly did not anticipate how the internet would change. You know, when we did this, it was a small technical community. Um, you know, it, we sort of had the engineering attitude, if you build it, the users will come later. It worked for the IPv4 internet. You know, it started out as a research project. You know, no one had any idea what was going to happen. You know, no one had any idea there was gonna be social networks with ad, built based on advertising and collecting, I'm not sure if I should say it's stealing your personal data or selling your personal data. That, that was not something anyone understood. Um, you know, it, it moved quickly from, you know, build it and it'll get used to there had to be a business case. Um, you know, and then I think this is most, well, we're, it's not completely done, but for a long time, a lot of the industry was really in denial that this needed to happen. And so any, you know, it was always the lowest priority project. And I think we see that in still in lots of places, but it's a lot better. Um, it, it's clearly gone from, do I need to do this to, you know, okay, I'm gonna have to do it, but it's a question of when. Um, and the other thing I'd note is that it's not, no one ever really did anything like this before. I, I, I don't know of any examples of, distributed networks like the internet where you have to get everyone to do the same thing for something to happen. I don't know if there's ever been a transition like this. I mean, I was involved in the ARPANET NCP to TCP transition, but that was like so much easier because one organization ran the network and they built a schedule and they did a test day 
and then they gave people a little bit more time and then they turned off the old one. This would be so much easier if we could just turn off IPv4 on the internet and then everyone would be really motivated to do it. But it doesn't work that way. I mean, that's the internet strength. It's this, people do this by, for their, in their own self-interest. And it works for most things, but it makes making big changes harder. Um, and so, you know, the, the, one of the lessons I've learned with this is that it's very hard to deploy anything new on the internet that requires global deployment before it's useful. Um, you know, anything that happens today needs an immediate return. You know, it has to solve a local problem before it can be a global, before it can solve a global problem. And, and this, this, this was a big change. I mean, uh, there's two, I'm very proud of my, the work I did on IPv6 or continue to do, but I, I was also involved in the ITF in a protocol called Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol. And, um, you know, we, I chaired the working group and we had the protocol spec. And that was wonderful in a very different way in that if you had two routers implementing it, it worked, it solved a problem. It got very widely deployed, but it only required one organization to deploy it, you know, two instances of it, and it would solve the problem. It solved a real, a real local problem. It didn't require global coordination. So that got, the, there wasn't even any question about whether it was gonna get deployed. It just did, but people who wanted it, got, people who deployed it got an immediate benefit. And it's very hard to do things that require everyone to do something before there's a benefit. Um, but I think the good news for IPv6 with the address run out, and I think the problems we're going to see with, you know, carrier grade NAT and making the network much more fragile because there's lots of state in single places, I, th I think it has, IPv6 is now solving a local problem. And so this is the thing that I think is gonna continue to drive it forward. So how am I doing? They haven't put up the 15 minute sign yet, so I'm good. Okay, so we'll talk a bit about internet security and then the internet of insecure things. So there's some relationship between the two. Um, so this is um, something I wonder about, and I will admit this is a rant. So I don't, I don't know if rant translates well into Spanish, but um, bear with me. Um, so I wonder why people choose the platform with the most exploits to run. Um, why they don't upgrade to the latest version of the operating system. Why they don't apply patches and updates. Why they don't run any virus, any malware, any ransomware, whatever, you know, we've built all these cool tools that pr help protect you. Um, why they run systems that don't have any active support anymore. Um, you know, I, I just have to conclude they wanna run malware. You know, it, part of the internet security problem, some of it is a technology problem, but I think a lot of it is a people problem. I mean, I'll, so I used to work at um, a company called Bolt, Baranek and Newman. They built the, it's where I learned how to do this stuff. They built the ARPANET. We built the early internet there. So I'm on a, uh, I don't know if they're gonna hear this, but um, so I'm on a mailing list of, it's called XBBN, so former BBN employees. There, there's a tiny bit of BBN left as part of Raytheon, but we'll ignore that. Essentially assume the real, the BBN I knew is gone. But I'm just still amazed at how people who are s smart and intelligent and understand networking, you know, they'll have long discussions about how to keep some old version of an email program running on an old version of an operating system. They just don't under, seem to understand that the security, that they're also, this makes them more vulnerable to security problems. And, and it's, and if they don't get it, then people who aren't, don't have that technical background don't get it at all. So, so this is, this is, I think, a real, a real people problem. So some of the internet security problem is not technology, it's really people. You just have to think about it in the right way. 
So, you know, internet security is a problem. It's clearly hard to make um, sec making systems secure. It's difficult. Um, uh, Fernando, I think, understands this quite well. Um, and it seems like openness and secure are opposites. You know, you can't, in some ways, you can't do it both ways. Um, and I think I sort of reluctantly conclude that general purpose computing platforms are very difficult to make secure. The more f functions and features they have, the more vulnerabilities they have. You know, it's, it, you want to be flexible, you want to do a lot of things, but it's hard to do it and make it secure. Isolation from the internet does not protect systems. Um, there's no inside or outside anymore. You know, devices move around just because you have a firewall. And firewall, you know, I work for a security company. We sell a lot of firewalls. They're important. But, you know, we all take our laptops everywhere. And sometimes it's in a secure environment and other, you know, devices need to protect themselves. Open source doesn't mean it's secure. Yes, people look at the code, but th there's bugs in that code too. Um, and more recently, HTTPS does not protect you from bad actors. It gives you a secure connection, but it doesn't, you don't, you still have to worry about who you're talking to. Motivations for attack, you know, range from state-sponsored, um, people who want to make money by the attack, and then uh, somewhat more recently, um, but political attacks, you know, so it's fake news and all of that. These are all security problems. And it doesn't seem to be getting any better. And in fact, it's maybe getting worse. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, trust in the internet has definitely declined. You know, I think this start, really started with the Snowden NSA re revelations. Um, I think everyone was surprised how much monitoring there is. Um, and it's made it, you know, made it much harder for the West to speak for the importance of an open internet. There's been clearly more calls to regulate the internet. It, it hasn't, and it's, you know, there's various degrees of openness in different countries these days. So there are, the good news is there's a lot of things being done. Uh, the ITF and other organizations are moving to make protocols have encryption on by default. I think this is a great thing. Uh, content providers are enabling encryption. Google has reported that they're seeing 93% of their traffic is, you know, is HTTPS. So this is great. Um, bra browsers are now flagging non-secure sites. This is also good. Um, it, this won't stop pervasive monitoring, but it makes it harder to see all the traffic all the time. And, you know, it, if someone really wants to, to look at what you as an individual are do it, doing, then, you know, th that's always going to be a problem. But it, it, I think it's better for most people. Um, but, you know, a more recent thing is now that we've made certificates easier to get, people, bad actors are getting them too. They, they like having their traffic be secure too. So just because it's, you know, in your browser, it has that little lock, it doesn't mean it's who you think you're talking to. So you still have to be careful. Um, so it's, this was sort of, a, I think, a shock to a lot of people, even me to some extent. I sort of, once, once you sort of think about it, it's, it makes perfect sense. It's just saying the link is encrypted. It doesn't say anything about who you're communicating with. Um, I think that platforms like Apple's iOS may in fact be the future for applications. You know, where the, the vendor has control over it, they only allow you to run verified applications. Um, the vendor has the ability to remove applications that are bad. Uh, Windows 10 S is another example of this. Um, I don't think many consumers will care, but I think it may be the only, the only model we have that actually works to create secure platforms. Um, but we still have a big problem of what to do about the base of old systems. So that's a good intro to the, what I call the internet of insecure things. Um, so we clearly have a problem. Most IoT devices are not secure. There's numerous security weaknesses. And, and some of these are, these are not real sophisticated weaknesses. These are things like 
default passwords that you can look up in the manual and which most people don't change. You know, they may have hidden passwords, firmware passwords that are not, you know, changeable. There's no software updates. There's no vendor software support. It's just, you know, it's sort of everything we've learned about general purpose computers is sort of been ignored by a lot of people making these things. Gardner says that we have like over six billion of these now and it's gonna grow to 20 billion. And so we got 20 billion devices on the internet soon that aren't secure. What, what's the problem here? Um, I'm gonna, what's my time schedule? Okay, good. So, I mean, I first noticed this in a couple of years ago. Um, there were several attacks. There was the attack on Krebs on security. You put this, Brian Krebs has a nice security blog. I recommend it to, to read it. He's quite good. Uh, he published an article about a company that was basically a DDoS for hire service. You could hire them to DDoS people, and you know, it made money. Like a lot, a lot of bad, bad actors are there to make money. Um, and two weeks after he published these articles, his site was attacked. There was like 620 gigabits of attack traffic from IoT devices. Uh, a, a month later, a, a large international hosting provider, OVH, was attacked. That was a terabit of traffic. Uh, they were, they have a a strong infrastructure, they were able to sustain it, but it was still a very big attack. I mean, and the attacks are coming from devices like this. Um, and they all, um, you know, you, and you can go look up, you can find websites that list what all the default passwords are. So it's the, the, the malware that is used here just goes, discovers devices and tries, tries its list of default passwords. And a lot of times it, lock, they're able to log in. It's not like a, some sophistic, you know, they're not doing buffer overruns. They're not doing any sophisticated attack. They're just logging in with the default passwords. I mean, from a security point of view, it's just terrible the way these products are built. And some of these are from even well-known vendors. Um, so it's just, you know, they don't, don't require, when you install it, they don't require you to change the default password. It's just terrible. And then there was the, the thing that really did it was there was an attack on Dyn, the, a large DNS provider. Um, they were attacked in October 2016. Um, and this was done by the Mirai IoT malware. It peaked at 1.2 terabits per second. And the reason this got a lot of attention, unlike the others, I mean, who knew who Brian Krebs was, is that they were providing DNS service for companies like Amazon, CNN, New York Times. A lot of big internet sites went down because of this attack for a while until Dyn got it under control. And so this, this hit the, you know, hit the public press. And all of a sudden, you know, these kind of attacks were real. Um, you know, it was caused by um, malware called Mirai, and there's been several updates to this, of course. And the the person, this this uh, malware was also the source for this was released, so it made it easy for other, it made it easy for people to understand what it was doing, and it had this default password list, but it also made it possible for other people to adopt it and add that kind of capability into other malware. So we've seen other malware. And there's a, continues to be a, um, a string of attacks based on these things, because we haven't been able to figure out how to do anything about these deployed devices. Um, and I think we should be really worried about this. Um, it, given the scale of these attacks, and you can, you know, they're hard to stop because they're very distributed, and each device isn't sending a lot of traffic, so you can't, it's hard to block individual IP addresses. Um, you know, the number of growth of these devices. And, and in some ways, because these things don't get updated, it's actually a lot harder to deal with than, you know, laptops and desktops and servers and mobile devices that generally have pretty good support. Um, and I think it's gonna be a real challenge to fix this. I mean, some of these problems are easy, you know, don't have default login passwords you know, don't have fixed firmware passwords, do software updates, fix software bugs, you know, 
we know how to do that. But the other problems are harder. Um, you know, how do you provide, you know, these devices, you know, you go on Amazon and you type in IP camera, you get pages and pages of products. They cost, you know, between 50 and $100. And so, if, you know, that means the manufacturing cost is pretty low to sell at that price, which means they don't have a lot of margin left to make them better. You know, it's, so it's very cost competitive. So it's, you know, how do you provide support for devices like this? You know, how long do you think the support will be, or assuming there's any support at all? Um, what do we do with million, billions of unsupported devices on the internet? Um, you know, I, I, I wish I knew the answer to this. You know, and it's also a problem in that the, uh, the user of, the owner of these devices, they probably don't even know this is going on. It's not, you know, the IP camera probably still works. You know, so when, when I first learned about IoT and IP cameras, I thought, I thought the security vulnerability was gonna be somebody, you know, you have one of these in your house, I have one in my house. The security problem was going to be someone watching me do stuff or think, you know, looking at the sensor data or things like that. But it turned out it's, you know, the vulnerability was using them for DDoS attacks. And this is, um, yeah, who knew? Um, the economics of this are very challenging. You know, who is responsible? Is there any liability anywhere? It doesn't seem so. I mean, they're made, it's not like there's one big manufacturer. They, they get sourced in a lot of places. The components come from other places. You know, it's not clear there's any support. Does the, the ISB have any role? Um, and, and really, how do you provide long-term support for very low-cost devices? I, I don't think we know how to do this. Um, and you know, what do you do with devices when support ends? Do they turn themselves off and break, or do they just keep running? It seems like it's the latter. Um, so, you know, how can we fix this? Um, you know, is this something the market can fix? Is this something, is there any alternative to government regulation? But even that's not so simple, because this is a worldwide problem. You may create appropriate regulation in your country, but you may get attacked from all the IoT devices in another country. You know, it's the internet. It, you don't have, it doesn't have to be local. So the, the best idea I have um, is, I mean, we, we need technical standards or product standards for how you should build these things, but I think we need to treat this as a product safety issue. We, we know how to do this for a lot of other kinds of devices where, you know, if the, the product is dangerous, it might hurt you. Um, you know, we have in a lot, most places have laws and regulations for this, and companies who build them that fail have liability. So I think we need to figure out some way for vendors and, and probably the retail channel um, to have some sort of liability for security failures in devices like this, or all device, you know, all devices. You know, we're seeing cars, you know, we're seeing all kinds of stuff being on the internet. Um, I just, I have a brand new Tesla at home and it's on the internet all the time. It's sort of cool because I can go see what it's doing and see if my wife is driving it or whatever. But, you know, all these devices are on the internet, so, and I don't even want to think about what happens if someone, you know, takes control of it. But, you know, we need to figure, this is become, gonna become a bigger and bigger problem. So it's something all, we all need to understand and try to do something about. Um, I wrote an article on this uh, that um, was published in the Internet Protocol Journal. It goes into this in more detail. Um, and then I also found um, a cartoon that I really like, the inter Internet of Ransomware Things. I don't know if you can, yeah, maybe you can read this. But, you know, th this, this is about a year old or so, but it's turned out to be really true. You know, ransomware is becoming a bigger problem. And, you know, if you can take over all these IoT devices, they, um, they're going to start asking you for money. So it's... Um, yeah, careful what you wish for, I guess. So um, one more thing, and I'll call this for extra credit, just um, 
So uh, I, several years ago, I wrote um, an RFC that was published in the beginning of April of 2013 called Design Considerations for Fast and Light Communication. So you, I would encourage you to read this. I mean, the basic premise was that if you can communicate faster than light, then the, you know, then time clearly goes backwards because you know, you know, you know, we know from Einstein that you get closer to the speed of light, time slows down. So it just, I just extrapolated that if you go faster than the speed of light, then t you know, time goes backwards. So this means for protocols that you know, w normally you send a packet and then later it's received somewhere, and you send an ACK back. So this sort of turns all that around because you're going to receive the acknowledgement before you send the data. So it's nice in some ways because you know when to send the data. But uh, you might read this. I, I, I enjoyed writing it, and I hope, hope you will enjoy reading it. So thank you. Questions? Well, I have a question. I, I don't know if I can. Your name, uh, Andre Conte from Panama. Oh, Lo no, puedo preguntar no, no. en español para que se entienda. Le traducen. So, could you repeat? Because I didn't have this going yet. Okay. Eh, eh, mi pregunta es: ¿qué consejo, qué consejo nos podría dar? referente al futuro del Internet, porque nos ha dado toda la evidencia de que Internet of Things es lo que está actualmente y lo que viene, pero eso significaría, y con IPv6 prácticamente tendrían una IP pública para todos los aparatos. Y es bueno porque en, en temas de programación es más sencillo, pero eh, tendríamos que tener alguna clase de router slash super firewall next generation en la casa porque, o sea, estamos hablando de que todos los equipos van a tener una IP pública y no sé si un router Linksys vaya a aguantar al peso un ataque de DDoS, como usted lo ha dicho, de un millón de cámaras y microondas y zapatos, Teslas, o sea, me explico, es algo complicado, ¿no? O sea, ¿qué es lo que sigue actualmente? ¿Se tendrá que inventar alguna clase nueva de router que pueda proteger a ese nivel eh, nuestros aparatos y nuestra seguridad y privacidad en, en nuestras casas? So, interesting question. Um, so, I mean, a couple of things. So, so, all these IoT devices are, you know, they're not running IPv6. So, you know, and they're all likely behind network address translators, which have a certain form of security. But that didn't seem to protect us, did it? I mean, so having NAT and so forth with all these devices behind it, it didn't take much to get them to be infected and to find others. So, the, so even I mean, I mean, in the future, I think all the devices are, are, are gonna have IPv6 because I know NAT is not uh, something that was made for uh, to secure things, but but in the future, I think all gonna use IPv6 and all right. gonna have a, a public IP address, no? I think in the future. Well, Not right now, but in the future. Right, so, so you, you may have, let's see, when I do, do, do it with the, this on, I get an echo. Um, so I me mean, with IPv6, you're gonna need, you know, it won't be a NAT, you're gonna need some sort of firewall. I think that's still safe. But I think the important message here is the devices themselves need to be able to protect themselves. You can't, the, the hard exterior soft interior model doesn't really work. And so all these IoT devices need to be resilient from being attacked in the first place. And, and that's not really a V4, V6 thing. I mean, I think it's actually better that everybody has global public addresses because you know it's a lot easier to see who's doing things than, than when they're all behind multiple layers of NAT. I th think that's going to be increasingly a large problem, you know, in diagnosing problems and attacks. But um, so I, I don't think V6 makes this w worse or better. I think the problem is really about device security. Well, I think I'm, I'm not going to purchase or buy something from China. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, it, it's very, it's very hard to avoid that because stuff gets the the channels that this stuff, everything is built, stuff gets made from pieces all over the place. I I can do it in English. Oh. Easier for you. Thank you. Uh, somehow answering uh, what. Uh, Andre is saying, also responding to your question that you don't have your solution. You don't have the solution you mentioned during your presentation about uh, how you can buy cameras and make sure that they are safe or are maintained by the vendors and so on. Uh, we had in Europe, actually in the Europol headquarters, this conversation with the European Commission, and I bring them this idea and they are looking into it so it, it, it should not be a so bad idea um, if you buy devices that work only in cloud it means like IP cameras which is the most common case it means that if the vendor go to bank group you need to throw away the device because it's not accessible anymore okay so if we mandate the same that we require FCC regulation, UL, C, and so on, a basic uh, test for security and common APIs, we are safe because we don't need to throw away the device if the vendor goes to bankrupt. And it will be very easy for entities like uh, Europe, regulation entities, and other parts of the world to actually require that. It, it has been done for modems and for many other devices, so why not? The point is we need to start thinking that security is so important as radio regulations or anything else. Would right. you agree with that? Yeah, I think I generally do agree. I mean, clearly that kind of work is very good and it will help. But, it, you know, it doesn't help with the installed base and it doesn't help with devices in other regions. So it's, that's what I mean by it's a worldwide problem. So that's, it, that's clear. In other regions it, it helps, not for all devices, but in other regions it helps because most of the time countries that don't have their own regulatory test, right. they also require the European ones or the North American ones and so on. So in general, more or less it helps. But, but it's also, it's not something that, cons I mean, I have, you know, I have one camera at home. I have no idea what it's doing or how secure it is. You know, it came with a web app, it came with an app, I can go look at it and control it, but I have no way of judging. And if I can't, then no one can. So, it, you know, that's part of the problem. There's no way of telling, there's no certification, there's Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Yeah. And yeah, I'm sure the com company will disappear after a while, but who knows what happens to its products? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, Bob. Uh, Paul Wilson here from APNIC. Um, I've got a question for you, uh, which is not exactly my question, but it's a question that I hear quite a lot, and uh, it's about IPv6. And I'm hoping that your answer might help me to answer it in future. So the question is, why didn't you design IPv6 so that it was somehow backward compatible with IPv4 so we didn't have these, these transition headaches? So I, I have heard that question before, thank you. So it's good to ask it in public. So, so the, I mean, we did think about it. The problem was really that IPv4 was not built with any forward capacity other than the version number which we did use. So there was no way, you know, had, had, there was nothing we could do to tell a V4 implementation that it was now talking to a thing with different addresses or anything like that. So it, it, it was really a limitation of the way V4 was designed more than, we couldn't figure out any way of doing it. Yes, if, if we could have, I think we would have done that. I mean. A lot, a lot of the work I did, the, the thing called IPay and stuff, which I have a hard time even remembering what they did now, um, was thinking a lot more about transition um, and how to do that. But you know, we even proposed some solutions that um, were sort of based on multiple V4 V4 like addresses. But the, the ITEP did not get a consensus around that, and it, and it had a number of limitations. 
So it, it were really limitations in IPv4 as opposed to something we could have done uh, yeah. in the way that would have been nice. Thank you. And you know, in the practice, you know, like even CLNP, you know, while it did have variable length addresses, you know, so at least in theory, you could start small and move big. No one ever implemented it that way. Uh, so I don't think anyone really knew how to do that. It was a theoretical capability as opposed to practical. Okay. Oscar Robles, uh, LACNIC. Um, uh, following up that question, um, in retrospective, uh, was that decision was uh, wrong or uh, right in the IPv6 implementation? So say that again. That decision uh, to not introduce backward compatibility, uh, was I wrong or well, right? It, the problem was not that we didn't, we, it's, the problem was not that we decided not to make it backwards compatible. The problem was there wasn't any way to do it and, and have larger addresses to build a bigger internet with the existing V4. So it, that, that's where the, you know, I mean, in hindsight, you know, when IPv4 was invented, they weren't thinking about such a large internet. You know, it got way bigger than anyone possibly imagined. You can sort of see that from the early address, the way the addresses were allocated then. You know, it was, th at that time, computers with these big things that you build rooms around, they weren't, you know, they weren't like this. And so the world changed in a lot of ways that nobody had any real imagination you know, or, or had we, I think it had the, would have had the other problem. If you were trying to build for today, you would have made it so complicated it would have failed and we'd be doing something else. So it's, um, you know, we used the tools we had at the time. Good, well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed coming here and talking to you. Hope it was helpful. Thank you.